Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, Book 3, Virtue and Vice, Exploring Courage, Temperance, and Self-Indulgence. 1. Voluntary and Involuntary Actions, Exploring the Moral Complexities. Since virtue is concerned with passions and actions, and on voluntary passions and actions praise and blame are bestowed, on those that are involuntary pardon, and sometimes also pity, to distinguish the voluntary and the involuntary is presumably necessary for those who are studying the nature of virtue, and useful also for legislators with a view to the assigning both of honors and of punishments. Those things, then, are thought involuntary, which take place under compulsion or owing to ignorance, and that is compulsory of which the moving principle is outside, being a principle in which nothing is contributed by the person who is acting or is feeling the passion, e.g., if he were to be carried somewhere by a wind, or by men who had him in their power. But with regard to the things that are done from fear of greater evils or for some noble object, e.g., if a tyrant were to order one to do some thing base, having one's parents and children in his power, and if one did the action they were to be saved, but otherwise would be put to death, it may be debated whether such actions are involuntary or voluntary. Something of the sort happens also with regard to the throwing of goods overboard in a storm, for in the abstract no one throws goods away voluntarily, but on condition of it securing the safety of himself and his crew any sensible man does so. Such actions, then, are mixed, but are more like voluntary actions, for they are worthy of choice at the time when they are done, and the end of an action is relative to the occasion. Both the terms, then, voluntary and involuntary, must be used with reference to the moment of action. Now the man acts voluntarily, for the principle that moves the instrumental parts of the body in such actions is in him, and the things of which the moving principle is in a man himself are in his power to do or not to do. Such actions, therefore, are voluntary, but in the abstract perhaps involuntary, for no one would choose any such act in itself. For such actions men are sometimes even praised, when they endure something base or painful in return for great and noble objects gained, in the opposite case they are blamed, since to endure the greatest indignities for no noble end or for a trifling end is the mark of an inferior person. On some actions praise indeed is not bestowed, but pardon is, when one does what he ought not under pressure which overstrains who man nature and which no one could withstand. But some acts, perhaps, we cannot be forced to do, but ought rather to face death after the most fearful sufferings, for the things that forced Euripides Alcmean to slay his mother seem absurd. It is difficult sometimes to determine what should be chosen at what cost, and what should be endured in return for what gain, and yet more difficult to abide by our decisions, for as a rule what is expected is painful, and what we are forced to do is base, whence praise and blame are bestowed on those who have been compelled or have not. What sort of acts, then, should be called compulsory? We answer that without qualification actions are so when the cause is in the external circumstances and the agent contributes nothing. But the things that in themselves are involuntary, but now and in return for these gains are worthy of choice, and whose moving principle is in the agent, are in themselves involuntary, but now and in return for these gains voluntary. They are more like voluntary acts, for actions are in the class of particulars, and the particular acts here are voluntary. What sort of things are to be chosen, and in return for what, it is not easy to state, for there are many differences in the particular cases. But if someone were to say that pleasant and noble objects have a compelling power, forcing us from without, all acts would be for him compulsory, for it is for these objects that all men do everything they do. And those who act under compulsion and unwillingly act with pain, but those who do acts for their pleasantness and nobility do them with pleasure, it is absurd to make external circumstances responsible, and not oneself, as being easily caught by such attractions, and to make oneself responsible for noble acts but the pleasant objects responsible for base acts. The compulsory, then, seems to be that whose moving principle is outside, the person compelled contributing nothing. Everything that is done by reason of ignorance is not voluntary, it is only what produces pain and repentance that is involuntary. For the man who has done something owing to ignorance, and feels not the least vexation at his action, has not acted voluntarily, since he did not know what he was doing, nor yet involuntarily, since he is not pained. 
of people, then, who act by reason of ignorance he who repents is thought an involuntary agent, and the man who does not repent may, since he is different, be called a not voluntary agent, for, since he differs from the other, it is better that he should have a name of his own. Acting by reason of ignorance seems also to be different from act ing in ignorance, for the man who is drunk or in a rage is thought to act as a result not of ignorance but of one of the causes mentioned, yet not knowingly but in ignorance. Now every wicked man is ignorant of what he ought to do and what he ought to abstain from, and it is by reason of error of this kind that men become unjust and in general bad, but the term involuntary tends to be used not if a man is ignorant of what is to his advantage, for it is not mistaken purpose that causes involuntary action, it leads rather to wickedness, nor ignorance of the universal. For that men are blamed, but ignorance of particulars, i.e., of the circumstances of the action. And the objects with which it is concerned. For it is on these that both pity and pardon depend, since the person who is ignorant of any of these acts involuntarily. Perhaps it is just as well, therefore, to determine their nature and number. A man may be ignorant, then, of who he is, what he is doing, what or whom he is acting on, and sometimes also what, e.g., what instrument, he is doing it with, and to what end, e.g., he may think his act will conduce to someone's safety, and how he is doing it, e.g., whether gently or violently. Now of all of these no one could be ignorant unless he were mad, and evidently also he could not be ignorant of the agent, for how could he not know himself? But of what he is doing a man might be ignorant, as for instance people say, it slipped out of their mouths as they were speaking, or, they did not know it was a secret, as Aeschylus said of the mysteries, or a man might say he, let it go off when he merely wanted to show its working, as the man did with the catapult. Again, one might think one's son was an enemy, as Merope did, or that a pointed spear had a button on it, or that a stone was pumicestone, or one might give a man a draft to save him, and really kill him, or one might want to touch a man, as people do in sparring, and really wound him. The ignorance may relate, then, to any of these things, i.e., of the circumstances of the action, and the man who was ignorant of any of these is thought to have acted involuntarily, and especially if he was ignorant on the most important points, and these are thought to be the circumstances of the action and its end. Further, the doing of an act that is called involuntary in virtue of ignorance of this sort must be painful and involve repentance. Since that which is done under compulsion or by reason of ignorance is involuntary, the voluntary would seem to be that of which the moving principle is in the agent himself, he being aware of the particular circumstances of the action. Presumably acts done by reason of an gur or appetite are not rightly called involuntary. For in the first place, on that showing none of the other animals will act voluntarily, nor will children, and secondly, is it meant that we do not do voluntarily any of the acts that are due to appetite or anger, or that we do the noble acts voluntarily and the base acts involuntarily? Is not this absurd, when one and the same thing is the cause? But it would surely be odd to describe as involuntary the things one ought to desire, and we ought both to be angry at certain things and to have an appetite for certain things, e.g., for health and for learning. Also what is involuntary is thought to be painful, but what is in accordance with appetite is thought to be please and. Again, what is the difference in respect of involuntariness between errors committed upon calculation and those committed in anger? Both are to be avoided, but the irrational passions are thought not less human than reason is, and therefore also the actions which proceed from anger or appetite are the man's actions. It would be odd, then, to treat them as involuntary. 2. Deliberation and Decision, Unraveling the Concept of Choice Both the voluntary and the involuntary having been delimited, we must next discuss choice, for it is thought to be most closely bound up with virtue and to discriminate characters better than actions do. Choice, then, seems to be voluntary, but not the same thing as the voluntary, the latter extends more widely. For both children and the lower animals share in voluntary action, but not in choice, and acts done on the spur of the moment we describe as voluntary, but not as chosen. Those who say it is appetite or anger or wish or a kind of opinion do not seem to be right. For choice is not common to irrational creatures as well, but appetite and anger are. 
Again, the incontinent man acts with appetite, but not with choice, while the continent man on the contrary acts with choice, but not with appetite. Again, appetite is contrary to choice, but not appetite to appetite. Again, appetite relates to the please, ant and the painful, choice neither to the painful nor to the pleasant. Still less is it anger, for acts due to anger are thought to be less than any other's objects of choice. But neither is it wish, though it seems near to it, for choice cannot relate to impossibles, and if any one said he chose them he would be thought silly, but there may be a wish even for impossibles, e.g., for immortality. And wish may relate to things that could in no way be brought about by one's own efforts, e.g., that a particular actor or athlete should win in a competition, but no one chooses such things, but only the things that he thinks could be brought about by his own efforts. Again, wish relates rather to the end, choice to the means, for instance, we wish to be healthy, but we choose the acts which will make us healthy, and we wish to be happy and say we do, but we cannot well say we choose to be so, for, in general, choice seems to relate to the things that are in our own power. For this reason, too, it cannot be opinion, for opinion is thought to relate to all kinds of things, no less to eternal things and impossible things than to things in our own power, and it is distinguished by its falsity or truth, not by its badness or goodness, while choice is distinguished rather by these. Now with opinion in general perhaps no one even says it is identical. But it is not identical even with any kind of opinion, for by choosing what is good or bad we are men of a certain character, which we are not by holding certain opinions. And we choose to get or avoid something good or bad, but we have opinions about what a thing is or whom it is good for or how it is good for him, we can hardly be said to opine to get or avoid anything. And choice is praised for being related to the right object rather than for being rightly related to it, opinion for being truly related to its object. And we choose what we best know to be good, but we opine what we do not quite know, and it is not the same people that are thought to make the best choices and to have the best opinions, but some are thought to have fairly good opinions, but by reason of vice to choose what they should not. If opinion precedes choice or accompanies it, that makes no difference, for it is not this that we are considering, but whether it is identical with some kind of opinion. What, then, or what kind of thing is it, since it is none of the things we have mentioned? It seems to be voluntary, but not all that is voluntary to be an object of choice. Is it, then, what has been decided on by previous deliberation? At any rate choice involves a rational principle and thought. Even the name seems to suggest that it is what is chosen before other things. 3. Deliberation and Choice, Exploring the Boundaries of Human Agency Do we deliberate about everything, and is everything a possible subject of deliberation, or is deliberation impossible about some things? We ought presumably to call not what a fool or a madman would deliberate about, but what a sensible man would deliberate about, a subject of deliberation. Now about eternal things no one deliberates, e.g., about the material universe or the incommensurability of the diagonal and the side of a square. But no more do we deliberate about the things that involve movement but always happen in the same way, whether of necessity or by nature or from any other cause, e.g., the solstices and the risings of the stars, nor about things that happen now in one way, now in another, e.g., droughts and rains, nor about chance events, like the finding of treasure. But we do not deliberate even about all human affairs, for instance, no Spartan deliberates about the best constitution for the Scythians. For none of these things can be brought about by our own efforts. We deliberate about things that are in our power and can be done, and these are in fact what is left. For nature, necessity, and chance are thought to be causes, and also reason in everything that depends on man. Now every class of men deliberates about the things that can be done by their own efforts. And in the case of exact and self-contained sciences there is no deliberation, e.g., about the letters of the alphabet, for we have no doubt how they should be written, but the things that are brought about by our own efforts, but not always in the same way, are the things about which we deliberate, e.g., questions of medical treatment or of money-making. And we do so more in the case of the art of navigation than in that of gymnastics, inasmuch as it has been less exactly worked out, and again about other things in the same ratio, and more also in the case of the arts than in that of the sciences, 
for we have more doubt about the former. Deliberation is concerned with things that happen in a certain way for the most part, but in which the event is obscure, and with things in which it is indeterminate. We call in others to aid us in deliberation on important questions, distrusting ourselves as not being equal to deciding. We deliberate not about ends but about means. For a doctor does not deliberate whether he shall heal, nor an orator whether he shall persuade, nor a statesman whether he shall produce law and order, nor does any one else deliberate about his end. They assume the end and consider how and by what means it is to be attained, and if it seems to be produced by several means they consider by which it is most easily and best produced, while if it is achieved by one only they consider how it will be achieved by this and by what means this will be achieved, till they come to the first cause, which in the order of discovery is last. For the person who deliberates seems to investigate and analyze in the way described as though he were analyzing a geometrical construction, not all investigation appears to be deliberation, for instance mathematical investigations, but all deliberation is investigation, and what is last in the order of analysis seems to be first in the order of becoming. And if we come on an impossibility, we give up the search, e.g., if we need money and this cannot be got, but if a thing appears possible we try to do it. By possible things I mean things that might be brought about by our own efforts, and these in a sense include things that can be brought about by the efforts of our friends, since the moving principle is in ourselves. The subject of investigation is sometimes the instruments, sometimes the use of them, and similarly in the other cases, sometimes the means, sometimes the mode of using it or the means of bringing it about. It seems, then, as has been said, that man is a moving principle of actions, now deliberation is about the things to be done by the agent himself and actions are for the sake of things other than themselves. For the end cannot be a subject of deliberation, but only the means, nor indeed can the particular facts be a subject of it, as whether this is bread or has been baked as it should, for these are matters of perception. If we are to be always deliberating, we shall have to go on to infinity. The same thing is deliberated upon and is chosen, except that the object of choice is already determinate, since it is that which has been decided upon as a result of deliberation that is the object of choice. For every one ceases to inquire how he is to act when he has brought the moving principle back to himself and to the ruling part of himself, for this is what chooses. This is plain also from the ancient constitutions, which Homer represented, for the kings announced their choices to the people. The object of choice being one of the things in our own power which is desired after deliberation, choice will be deliberate desire of things in our own power, for when we have decided as a result of deliberation, we desire in accordance with our deliberation. We may take it, then, that we have described choice in outline, and stated the nature of its objects and the fact that it is concerned with means. 4. Perception of the good, exploring the nature of wish. That wish is for the end has already been stated, some think it is for the good, others for the apparent good. Now those who say that the good is the object of wish must admit in consequence that that which the man who does not choose a right wishes for is not an object of wish, for if it is to be so, it must also be good, but it was, if it so happened, bad, while those who say the apparent good is the object of wish must admit that there is no natural object of wish, but only what seems good to each man. Now different things appear good to different people, and, if it so happens, even contrary things. If these consequences are unpleasing, are we to say that absolutely and in truth the good is the object of wish, but for each person the apparent good, that that which is in truth an object of wish is an object of wish to the good man, while any chance thing may be so the bad man, as in the case of bodies also the things that are in truth wholesome are wholesome for bodies which are in good condition. While for those that are diseased other things are wholesome, or bitter or sweet or hot or heavy, and so on, since the good man judges each class of things rightly, and in each the truth appears to him. For each state of character has its own ideas of the noble and the pleasant, and perhaps the good man differs from others most by seeing the truth in each class of things, being as it were the norm and measure of them. In most things the error seems to be due to pleasure, for it appears a good when it is not. We therefore choose the pleasant as a good, and avoid pain as an evil. 5. Volition and Virtue, Exploring the Nature of Moral Agency 
The end, then, being what we wish for, the means what we deliberate about and choose, actions concerning means must be according to choice and voluntary. Now the exercise of the virtues is concerned with means. Therefore virtue also is in our own power, and so too vice. For where it is in our power to act it is also in our power not to act, and vice versa, so that, if to act, where this is noble, is in our power, not to act, which will be base, will also be in our power, and if not to act, where this is noble, is in our power, to act, which will be base, will also be in our power. Now if it is in our power to do noble or base acts, and likewise in our power not to do them, and this was what being good or bad meant, then it is in our power to be virtuous or vicious. The saying that, no one is voluntarily wicked nor involuntarily happy seems to be partly false and partly true, for no one is involuntarily happy, but wickedness is voluntary. Or else we shall have to dispute what has just been said, at any rate, and deny that man is a moving principle or begetter of his actions as of children. But if these facts are evident and we cannot refer actions to moving principles other than those in ourselves, the acts whose moving principles are in us must themselves also be in our power and voluntary. Witness seems to be born to this both by individuals in their private capacity and by legislators themselves, for these punish and take vengeance on those who do wicked acts, unless they have acted under compulsion or as a result of ignorance for which they are not themselves responsible, while they honor those who do noble acts, as though they meant to encourage the latter and deter the former. But no one is encouraged to do the things that are neither in our power nor voluntary, it is assumed that there is no gain in being persuaded not to be hot or in pain or hungry or the like, since we shall experience these feelings none the less. Indeed, we punish a man for his very ignorance, if he is thought responsible for the ignorance, as when penalties are doubled in the case of drunkenness, for the moving principle is in the man himself, since he had the power of not getting drunk and his getting drunk was the cause of his ignorance. And we punish those who are ignorant of anything in the laws that they ought to know and that is not difficult, and so too in the case of anything else that they are thought to be ignorant of through carelessness, we assume that it is in their power not to be ignorant, since they have the power of taking care. But perhaps a man is the kind of man not to take care. Still they are themselves by their slack lives responsible for becoming men of that kind, and men make themselves responsible for being unjust or self-indulgent, in the one case by cheating and in the other by spending their time in drinking bouts and the like, for it is activities exercised on particular objects that make the corresponding character. This is plain from the case of people training for any contest or action, they practice the activity the whole time. Now not to know that it is from the exercise of activities on particular objects that states of character are produced is the mark of a thoroughly senseless person. Again, it is irrational to suppose that a man who acts unjustly does not wish to be unjust or a man who acts self-indulgently to be self-indulgent. But if without being ignorant a man does the things which will make him unjust, he will be unjust voluntarily. Yet it does not follow that if he wishes he will cease to be unjust and will be just. For neither does the man who is ill become well on those terms. We may suppose a case in which he is ill voluntarily, through living incontinently in disobeying his doctors. In that case it was then open to him not to be ill, but not now, when he has thrown away his chance, just as when you have let a stone go it is too late to recover it, but yet it was in your power to throw it, since the moving principle was in you. So, too, to the unjust and to the self-indulgent man it was open at the beginning not to become men of this kind, and so they are unjust and self-indulgent voluntarily, but now that they have become so it is not possible for them not to be so. But not only are the vices of the soul voluntary, but those of the body also for some men, whom we accordingly blame, while no one blames those who are ugly by nature, we blame those who are so owing to want of exercise and care. So it is, too, with respect to weakness and infirmity, no one would reproach a man blind from birth or by disease or from a blow, but rather pity him, while every one would blame a man who was blind from drunkenness or some other form of self-indulgence. Of vices of the body, then, those in our own power are blamed, those not in our power are not. And if this be so, in the other cases also the vices that are blamed must be in our own power. Now someone may say that all men desire the apparent good, 
but have no control over the appearance, but the end appears to each man in a form answering to his character. We reply that if each man is some, how responsible for his state of mind, he will also be himself somehow responsible for the appearance, but if not, no one is responsible for his own evil doing, but everyone does evil acts through ignorance of the end, thinking that by these he will get what is best, and the aiming at the end is not self-chosen but one must be born with an eye, as it were, by which to judge rightly and choose what is truly good, and he is well endowed by nature who is well endowed with this. For it is what is greatest and most noble, and what we cannot get or learn from another, but must have just such as it was when given us at birth, and to be well and nobly endowed with this will be perfect and true excellence of natural endowment. If this is true, then, how will virtue be more voluntary than vice? To both men alike, the good and the bad, the end appears and is fixed by nature or however it may be, and it is by referring everything else to this that men do whatever they do. Whether, then, it is not by nature that the end appears to each man such as it does appear, but something also depends on him, or the end is natural but because the good man adopts the means voluntarily virtue is voluntary, vice also will be none the less voluntary, for in the case of the bad man there is equally present that which depends on himself in his actions even if not in his end. If, then, as is asserted, the virtues are voluntary, for we are ourselves somehow partly responsible for our states of character, and it is by being persons of a certain kind that we assume the end to be so and so, the vices also will be voluntary, for the same is true of them. With regard to the virtues in general we have stated their genus in outline, viz. That they are means and that they are states of character, and that they tend, and by their own nature, to the doing of the acts by which they are produced, and that they are in our power and voluntary, and act as the right rule prescribes. But actions and states of character are not voluntary in the same way, for we are masters of our actions from the beginning right to the end, if we know the particular facts, but though we control the beginning of our states of character the gradual progress is not obvious any more than it is in illnesses, because it was in our power, however, to act in this way or not in this way, therefore the states are voluntary. Let us take up the several virtues, however, and say which they are and what sort of things they are concerned with and how they are concerned with them, at the same time it will become plain how many they are. And first let us speak of courage. 6. Courage and the noble death, understanding fearlessness. That it is a mean with regard to feelings of fear and confidence has already been made evident, and plainly the things we fear are terrible things, and these are, to speak without qualification, evils, for which reason people even define fear as expectation of evil. Now we fear all evils, e.g., disgrace, poverty, disease, friendlessness, death, but the brave man is not thought to be concerned with all, for to fear some things is even right and noble, and it is base not to fear them, e.g., disgrace, he who fears this is good and modest, and he who does not is shameless. He is, however, by some people called brave, by a transference of the word to a new meaning, for he has in him something which is like the brave man, since the brave man also is a fearless person. Poverty and disease we perhaps ought not to fear, nor in general the things that do not proceed from vice and are not due to a man himself. But not even the man who is fearless of these is brave. Yet we apply the word to him also in virtue of a similarity, for some who in the dangers of war are cowards are liberal and are confident in face of the loss of money. Nor is a man a coward if he fears insult to his wife and children or envy or anything of the kind, nor brave if he is confident when he is about to be flogged. With what sort of terrible things, then, is the brave man concerned? Surely with the greatest, for no one is more likely than he to stand his ground against what is awe-inspiring. Now death is the most terrible of all things, for it is the end, and nothing is thought to be any longer either good or bad for the dead. But the brave man would not seem to be concerned even with death in all circumstances, e.g., at sea, or in disease. In what circumstances, then? Surely in the noblest. Now such deaths are those in battle, for these take place in the greatest and noblest danger. And these are correspondingly honored in city-states and at the courts of monarchs. Properly, then, he will be called brave who is fear less in face of a noble death, and of all emergencies that involve death, 
and the emergencies of war are in the highest degree of this kind. Yet at sea also, and in disease, the brave man is fearless, but not in the same way as the seaman, for he has given up hope of safety, and is disliking the thought of death in this shape, while they are hopeful because of their experience. At the same time, we show courage in situations where there is the opportunity of showing prowess or where death is noble, but in these forms of death neither of these conditions is fulfilled. 7. The Virtue of Courage, Finding the Middle Path Between Fear and Confidence What is terrible is not the same for all men, but we say there are things terrible even beyond human strength. These, then, are terrible to every one, at least to every sensible man, but the terrible things that are not beyond human strength differ in magnitude and degree, and so too do the things that inspire confidence. Now the brave man is as dauntless as man may be. Therefore, while he will fear even the things that are not beyond human strength, he will face them as he ought and as the rule directs, for honor's sake, for this is the end of virtue. But it is possible to fear these more, or less, and again to fear things that are not terrible as if they were. Of the faults that are committed one consists in fearing what one should not, another in fearing as we should not, another in fearing when we should not, and so on, and so too with respect to the things that inspire confidence. The man, then, who faces and who fears the right things and from the right motive, in the right way and from the right time, and who feels confidence under the corresponding conditions, is brave, for the brave man feels and acts according to the merits of the case and in whatever way the rule directs. Now the end of every activity is conformity to the corresponding state of character. This is true, therefore, of the brave man as well as of others. But courage is noble. Therefore the end also is noble, for each thing is defined by its end. Therefore it is for a noble end that the brave man endures and acts as courage directs. Of those who go to excess he who exceeds in fearlessness has no name, we have said previously that many states of character have no names, but he would be a sort of madman or insensible person if he feared nothing, neither earthquakes or the waves, as they say the Celts do not, while the man who exceeds in confidence about what really is terrible is rash. The rash man, however, is also thought to be boastful and only a pretender to courage, at all events, as the brave man is with regard to what is terrible, so the rash man wishes to appear, and so he imitates him in situations where he can. Hence also most of them are a mixture of rashness and cowardice, for, while in these situations they display confidence, they do not hold their ground against what is really terrible. The man who exceeds in fear is a coward, for he fears both what he ought not and as he ought not, and all the similar characterizations attached to him. He is lacking also in confidence, but he is more conspicuous for his excess of fear in painful situations. The coward, then, is a despairing sort of person, for he fears everything. The brave man, on the other hand, has the opposite disposition, for confidence is the mark of a hopeful disposition. The coward, the rash man, and the brave man, then, are concerned with the same objects but are differently disposed towards them for the first two exceed and fall short, while the third holds the middle, which is the right, position, and rash men are precipitate, and wish for dangers beforehand but draw back when they are in them, while brave men are keen in the moment of action, but quiet beforehand. As we have said, then, courage is a mean with respect to things that inspire confidence or fear, in the circumstances that have been stated, and it chooses or endures things because it is noble to do so, or because it is base not to do so. But to die to escape from poverty or love or anything painful is not the mark of a brave man, but rather of a coward, for it is softness to fly from what is troublesome, and such a man endures death not because it is noble but to fly from evil. 8. Exploring Varieties of Courage, Understanding Different Facets of Bravery Courage, then, is something of this sort, but the name is also applied to five other kinds. First comes the courage of the citizen-soldier, for this is most like true courage. Citizen-soldiers seem to face dangers because of the penalties imposed by the laws and the reproaches they would otherwise incur, and because of the honors they win by such action, and therefore those people seem to be bravest among whom cowards are held in dishonor and brave men in honor. 
This is the kind of courage that Homer depicts, e.g., in Diomede and in Hector. First will Polydamus be to heap reproach on me then, and for Hector one day, mid the Trojans shall utter his vaulting harangue, afraid was Tydides, and fled from my face. This kind of courage is most like to that which we described earlier, because it is due to virtue, for it is due to shame and to desire of a noble object, i.e., honor, and avoidance of disgrace, which is ignoble. One might rank in the same class even those who are compelled by their rulers, but they are inferior, inasmuch as they do what they do not from shame but from fear, and to avoid not what is disgraceful but what is painful, for their masters compel them, as Hector does. But if I shall spy any dastard that cowers far from the fight, vainly will such an one hope to escape from the dogs. And those who give them their posts, and beat them if they retreat, do the same, and so do those who draw them up with trenches or some thing of the sort behind them, all of these apply compulsion. But one ought to be brave not under compulsion but because it is noble to be so. Second. Experience with regard to particular facts is also thought to be courage, this is indeed the reason why Socrates thought courage was knowledge. Other people exhibit this quality in other dangers, and professional soldiers exhibit it in the dangers of war, for there seem to be many empty alarms in war, of which these have had the most comprehensive experience, therefore they seem brave, because the others do not know the nature of the facts. Again, their experience makes them most capable in attack and in defense, since they can use their arms and have the kind that are likely to be best both for attack and for defense, therefore they fight like armed men against unarmed or like trained athletes against amateurs, for in such contests too it is not the bravest men that fight best, but those who are strongest and have their bodies in the best condition. Professional soldiers turn cowards, however, when the danger puts too great a strain on them and they are inferior in numbers and equipment, for they are the first to fly, while citizen forces die at their posts, as in fact happened at the Temple of Hermes. For to the latter flight is disgraceful and death is preferable to safety on those terms, while the former from the very beginning faced the danger on the assumption that they were stronger, and when they know the facts they fly, fearing death more than disgrace, but the brave man is not that sort of person. Third. Passion also is sometimes reckoned as courage, those who act from passion, like wild beasts rushing at those who have wounded them, are thought to be brave, because brave men also are passionate, for passion above all things is eager to rush on danger, and hence Homer's, put strength into his passion and aroused their spirit and passion and hard he breathed panting and his blood boiled. For all such expressions seem to indicate the stirring and onset of passion. Now brave men act for honor's sake, but passion aids them, while wild beasts act under the influence of pain, for they attack because they have been wounded or because they are afraid, since if they are in a forest they do not come near one. Thus they are not brave because, driven by pain and passion, they rush on danger without foreseeing any of the perils, since at that rate even asses would be brave when they are hungry, for blows will not drive them from their food, and lust also makes adulterers do many daring things. Those creatures are not brave, then, which are driven on to danger by pain or passion. The courage that is due to passion seems to be the most natural, and to be courage if choice and motive be added. Men, then, as well as beasts, suffer pain when they are angry, and are pleased when they exact their revenge, those who fight for these reasons, however, are pugnacious but not brave, for they do not act for honor's sake nor as the rule directs, but from strength of feeling, they have, however, something akin to courage. Fourth. Nor are sanguine people brave, for they are confident in danger only because they have conquered often and against many foes. Yet they closely resemble brave men, because both are confident, but brave men are confident for the reasons stated earlier, while these are so because they think they are the strongest and can suffer nothing. Drunken men also behave in this way, they become sanguine. When their adventures do not succeed, however, they run away, but it was the mark of a brave man to face things that are, and seem, terrible for a man, because it is noble to do so and disgraceful not to do so. Hence also it is thought the mark of a braver man to be fearless and undisturbed in sudden alarms than to be so in those that are foreseen, for it must have proceeded more from a state of character, because less from preparation, acts that are foreseen may be chosen by calculation and rule, 
but sudden actions must be in accordance with one's state of character. Fifth. People who are ignorant of the danger also appear brave, and they are not far removed from those of a sanguine temper, but are inferior in as much as they have no self-reliance while these have. Hence also the sanguine hold their ground for a time, but those who have been deceived about the facts fly if they know or suspect that these are different from what they supposed, as happened to the Argives when they fell in with the Spartans and took them for Sicyonians. We have, then, described the character both of brave men and of those who are thought to be brave. 9. Understanding courage, facing fear and embracing pain for a noble end. Though courage is concerned with feelings of confidence and of fear, it is not concerned with both alike, but more with the things that inspire fear, for he who is undisturbed in face of these and bears himself as he should towards these is more truly brave than the man who does so towards the things that inspire confidence. It is for facing what is painful, then, as has been said, that men are called brave. Hence also courage involves pain, and is justly praised, for it is harder to face what is painful than to abstain from what is pleasant. Yet the end which courage sets before it would seem to be pleasant, but to be concealed by the attending circumstances, as happens also in athletic contests, for the end at which boxers aim is pleasant, the crown and the honors but the blows they take are distressing to flesh and blood, and painful, and so is their whole exertion, and because the blows and the exertions are many the end, which is but small, appears to have nothing pleasant in it. And so, if the case of courage is similar, death and wounds will be painful to the brave man and against his will, but he will face them because it is noble to do so or because it is base not to do so. And the more he is possessed of virtue in its entirety and the happier he is, the more he will be pained at the thought of death, for life is best worth living for such a man, and he is knowingly losing the greatest goods, and this is painful. But he is none the less brave, and perhaps all the more so, because he chooses noble deeds of war at that cost. It is not the case, then, with all the virtues that the exercise of them is pleasant, except in so far as it reaches its end. But it is quite possible that the best soldiers may be not men of this sort but those who are less brave but have no other good, for these are ready to face danger, and they sell their life for trifling gains. So much, then, for courage, it is not difficult to grasp its nature in outline, at any rate, from what has been said. 10. Exploring temperance, finding balance in bodily pleasures. After courage let us speak of temperance, for these seem to be the virtues of the irrational parts. We have said that temperance is a mean with regard to pleasures, for it is less, and not in the same way, concerned with pains, self-indulgence also is manifested in the same sphere. Now, therefore, let us determine with what sort of pleasures they are concerned. We may assume the distinction between bodily pleasures and those of the soul, such as love of honor and love of learning, for the lover of each of these delights in that of which he is a lover, the body being in no way affected, but rather the mind, but men who are concerned with such pleasures are called neither temperate nor self-indulgent. Nor, again, are those who are concerned with the other pleasures that are not bodily, for those who are fond of hearing and telling stories and who spend their days on anything that turns up are called gossips, but not self-indulgent, nor are those who are pained at the loss of money or of friends. Temperance must be concerned with bodily pleasures, but not all even of these, for those who delight in objects of vision, such as colors and shapes and painting, are called neither temperate nor self-indulgent, yet it would seem possible to delight even in these either as one should or to excess or to a deficient degree. And so too is it with objects of hearing, no one calls those who delight extravagantly in music or acting self-indulgent, nor those who do so as they ought temperate. Nor do we apply these names to those who delight in odor, unless it be incidentally, we do not call those self-indulgent who delight in the odor of apples or roses or incense, but rather those who delight in the odor of unguents or of dainty dishes, for self-indulgent people delight in these because these remind them of the objects of their appetite. And one may see even other people, when they are hungry, delighting in the smell of food, but to delight in this kind of thing is the mark of the self-indulgent man, for these are objects of appetite to him. Nor is there in animals other than man any pleasure connected with these senses, except incidentally. For dogs do not delight in the scent of hares, but in the eating of them, but the scent told them the hares were there, 
nor does the lion delight in the lowing of the ox, but in eating it, but he perceived by the lowing that it was near, and therefore appears to delight in the lowing, and similarly he does not delight because he sees a stag or a wild goat, but because he is going to make a meal of it. Temperance and self-indulgence, however, are concerned with the kind of pleasures that the other animals share in, which therefore appear slavish and brutish, these are touch and taste. But even of taste they appear to make little or no use, for the business of taste is the discriminating of flavors, which is done by wine tasters and people who season dishes, but they hardly take pleasure in making these discriminations, or at least self-indulgent people do not, but in the actual enjoyment, which in all cases comes through touch, both in the case of food and in that of drink and in that of sexual intercourse. This is why a certain gourmand prayed that his throat might become longer than a crane's, implying that it was the contact that he took pleasure in. Thus the sense with which self-indulgence is connected is the most widely shared of the senses, and self-indulgence would seem to be justly a matter of reproach, because it attaches to us not as men but as animals. To delight in such things, then, and to love them above all others, is brutish. For even of the pleasures of touch the most liberal have been eliminated, e.g., those produced in the gymnasium by rubbing and by the consequent heat, for the contact characteristic of the self-indulgent man does not affect the whole body but only certain parts. 11. Understanding Appetites, Exploring Self-Indulgence and Temperance Of the appetites some seem to be common, others to be peculiar to individuals and acquired, e.g., the appetite for food is natural, since everyone who is without it craves for food or drink, and sometimes for both, and for love also, as Homer says, if he is young and lusty but not every one craves for this or that kind of nourishment or love, nor for the same things. Hence such craving appears to be our very own. Yet it has of course something natural about it, for different things are pleasant to different kinds of people, and some things are more pleasant to every one than chance objects. Now in the natural appetites few go wrong, and only in one direction, that of excess, for to eat or drink whatever offers itself till one is surfeited is to exceed the natural amount, since natural appetite is the replenishment of one's deficiency. Hence these people are called belly gods, this implying that they fill their belly beat yond what is right. It is people of entirely slavish character that become like this. But with regard to the pleasures peculiar to individuals many people go wrong and in many ways. For while the people who are fond of so and so, are so called because they delight either in the wrong things, or more than most people do, or in the wrong way, the self-indulgent exceed in all three ways, they both delight in some things that they ought not to delight in, since they are hateful, and if one ought to delight in some of the things they delight in, they do so more than one ought and than most men do. Plainly, then, excess with regard to pleasures is self-indulgence and is culpable, with regard to pains one is not, as in the case of courage, called temperate for facing them or self-indulgent for not doing so, but the self-indulgent man is so called because he is pained more than he ought at not getting pleasant things, even his pain being caused by plea, sure, and the temperate man is so called because he is not pained at the absence of what is pleasant and at his abstinence from it. The self-indulgent man, then, craves for all pleasant things or those that are most pleasant, and is led by his appetite to choose these at the cost of everything else, hence he is pained both when he fails to get them and when he is merely craving for them, for appetite involves pain, but it seems absurd to be pained for the sake of pleasure. People who fall short with regard to pleasures and delight in them less than they should are hardly found, for such insensibility is not human. Even the other animals distinguish different kinds of food and enjoy some and not others, and if there is anyone who finds nothing pleasant and nothing more attractive than anything else, he must be something quite different from a man, this sort of person has not received a name because he hardly occurs. The temperate man occupies a middle position with regard to these objects. For he neither enjoys the things that the self-indulgent man enjoys most but rather dislikes them nor in general the things that he should not, nor anything of this sort to excess, nor does he feel pain or craving when they are absent, or does so only to a moderate degree, and not more than he should, nor when he should not, and so on, but the things that, being pleasant, make for health or for good condition, he will desire moderately and as he should, and also other pleasant things if they are not hindrances to these ends, or contrary to what is noble, 
or beyond his means. For he who neglects these conditions loves such plea, sures more than they are worth, but the temperate man is not that sort of person, but the sort of person that the right rule prescribes. 12. Exploring Self-Indulgence and Cowardice, A Comparative Analysis Self-indulgence is more like a voluntary state than cowardice. For the former is actuated by pleasure, the latter by pain, of which the one is to be chosen and the other to be avoided, and pain upsets and destroys the nature of the person who feels it, while pleasure does nothing of the sort. Therefore self-indulgence is more voluntary. Hence also it is more a matter of reproach, for it is easier to become accustomed to its objects, since there are many things of this sort in life, and the process of habituation to them is free from danger, while with terrible objects the reverse is the case. But cowardice would seem to be voluntary in a different degree from its particular manifestations, for it is itself painless, but in these we are upset by pain, so that we even throw down our arms and disgrace ourselves in other ways, hence our acts are even thought to be done under compulsion. For the self-indulgent man, on the other hand, the particular acts are voluntary, for he does them with craving and desire, but the whole state is less so, for no one craves to be self-indulgent. The name self-indulgence is applied also to childish faults, for they bear a certain resemblance to what we have been considering. Which is called after which, makes no difference to our present purpose, plainly, however, the later is called after the earlier. The transference of the name seems not a bad one, for that which desires what is base and which develops quickly ought to be kept in a chastened condition, and these characteristics belong above all to appetite and to the child, since children in fact live at the beck and call of appetite, and it is in them that the desire for what is pleasant is strongest. If, then, it is not going to be obedient and subject to the ruling principle, it will go to great lengths, for in an irrational being the desire for pleasure is insatiable even if it tries every source of gratification, and the exercise of appetite increases its innate force, and if appetites are strong and violent they even expel the power of calculation. Hence they should be moderate and few, and should in no way oppose the rational principle, and this is what we call an obedient and chastened state, and as the child should live according to the direction of his tutor, so the appetitive element should live according to rational principle. Hence the appetitive element in a temperate man should harmonize with the rational principle, for the noble is the mark at which both aim, and the temperate man craves for the things be ought, as he ought, as when he ought, and when he ought, and this is what rational principle directs. Here we conclude our account of temperance.